All right. Good morning, everybody. Can we can we centralize again? Unless you need to stay where you are for a hearing reason. Can we get everybody closer? How many have we got? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty, twenty-two ish. Boy, I don't know, guys. Thursday evening we had twenty people there, so you guys might want to step up your game on Sunday mornings. Otherwise, we might just switch. Good morning, online people. I think we're live today. Our apologies for last weekend. Our laptop was down. Uh, we are ordering a new one this week. All right. Cool. All right. So, everybody here knows me. I don't see any visitors. Good morning. My name's Uriah, in case you forgot. Uh, a couple of announcements to start us off. Uh, coming up very quick is our ecumenical service, July 30th at Franklin Park at 10 a.m. Mark your calendars, 10 a.m., not 9, at Franklin Park. Bring your own lawn chair. Uh, there will be communion that day. We're going to be with the Presbyterian Church. Uh, I think some from the Methodist Church on the Hill and maybe from Salem are planning on coming. Uh, and then the Zion ELCA will be there. Um, We'll have our praise band there. We'll have, hopefully, a joint choir there that day. Uh, and then following the service, there's a meal. And following that, at 2 o'clock, there will be a concert from Winona Avenue. It's going to be a wonderful day. It's looking right now, from, well, not that I can really tell, but the weather is going to be okay so far. Uh, a little bit far out to know for sure about that one. Uh, speaking of weather, it is potentially going to rain this Wednesday, which if you've been following the emails... Uh, we are supposed to have a uh, faith formation class at the Shawano Grace Trail, which is indeed an outdoor trail. Uh, so if it's raining, depending on how hard it's raining, uh, we'll be there still. But if it is raining, we'll shift uh, to Sunday after church, I believe. I'll reconfirm my calendar for that. But right now, we'll just plan on 6 o'clock at the Shawano Grace Trail. The address is in the weekly email. Uh, the faith formation class is going to be focusing around authentic spirituality and recognizing the personhood of each other and the nature that surrounds us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I worked really hard on it this week. It's going to be wonderful. Um, I don't know. I'm very, I'm very excited to be with whoever comes there. So, any questions, comments, concerns, announcements? Go to the hole. Perfect. Uh, we are using a new database system, as we've talked about. Uh, so if while we're in the first hymn, you see on me on my phone, it is because I'm marking who's here, because we'll be able to like track that now. Uh, and that's going to be kind of cool to see. Uh, I, the dashboards on it are really nice. So like Shelly and I every year have to report our average attendance anyways uh, to the conference and to the general synod. Uh, so it would be nice for us to have that electronically rather than Shelly's hand copy, which then we had to do all the math for ourselves uh, multiple times usually because we tended to miss a number or two. So we'll just have that already there. It'll show us different demographic information and whatnot too. Um, so probably during our opening hymn here, I'm going to be marking on my phone. So it's not that I'm not paying attention to you. <laughs> just want to make that clear. And it'll go away afterwards, I promise. Just like a dinner table. Um, Today's service, uh, you might realize, most of the hymns are almost, uh, I don't want to say lullaby-like, but they are definitely softer and meant to convey a sense of safety and of relief. Uh, so maybe consider that as you're singing today. So let us rise and join in our opening hymn, Praise to God, number five in the hymnal.
Let us partake now in our passing of the peace. Good morning, online people, and let's make our way back to our seats. Say hello to your wife and whole family. Oh, yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Bobby. Good morning, Denny. And as you make your way back, please be seated. Good morning to everyone. Am I on? Please join me in the call to worship. O spirit of the first song, the origins of a lullaby, we come here today with our burdens in tow. Would you grant us a comfort, O gentle Jesus? Our pain has no place to land no cradle for our sorrows to rock in. And say to us, yes, let it out. I've got you now. There, there, dear child, there, there. There, there, to the rhythm of a heartbeat, like a grandmother consoling her kin. There, there. There, there, like the psalmist singing in satisfaction. It's all right now. We made it home. There, there. There, there, shouts the activists out in the street. That's enough now, never again. There, there. For you are here, right here, ever with us, burden sharer, light maker, right here. And it is from this ancient, it is from this rest that we know you. Right here. Please join me in the unison invocation. O oh God of heaven and earth, who is glorified in the wisdom of children, the experts of presence and oneness, may we evoke your humble heart within us. May we wonder what it might mean to feel our exhaustion and your love at the exact same time. May we consider all you've tried to show give, or say to us that we weren't ready for. Prepare our souls to yoke with yours, to share in the good news that revives every living thing. We ask this in your name and energy. Amen. Let us join in Kummel Fount, number 459 in the hymnal.
please be seated. Last week we talked about a hymn that was from 1868. Any guesses on when the words for this hymn was originally written? Any guesses? 1758. So we're getting even older. <laughs> All righty. Let us join in our unison prayer for transformation. Spirit of God, you are always among us. And yet at times we don't notice or get caught up in our judgments. Not recognizing you and the stranger on the street or the stranger in me. Who does not do the things I want, but rather the things I hate. Perhaps we thought our certainty would keep us safe, or ignorance would keep us pain-free. But you show us the way of trust and awareness and what paves the path of peace. Forgive and help us, O God, by the power, grace, and connection. Amen. And please receive these words of grace. No matter the weight of our burdens or the age of our weariness, let us come before our rest-giving God, rest for our shame and unbelief, Rest for our bootstraps, egos, and false idols. Rest to open us up to grace that says, I feel so much better since I laid my burdens down. Rest for the receptivity to our yes. Yes to forgiveness, yes to repair, and yes to being fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the Hebrew Bible, Song of Songs, second verse, 8 through 13. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree pours forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. We're in the Gospel of Matthew again, chapter 11, verses 16 through 19 and 25 through 30. As a reminder, printed in your bulletins is the New Revised Standard Version wording, and I'll be reading from the First Nations Version, uh, an indigenous translation of the New Testament. Matthew 11, 16 through 19, 25 through 30. This generation, what can I compare them to? They are like children at a trading post, teasing each other, saying, You did not dance when we played the drum. You did not cry when we played a sad flute song. Gift of goodwill did not feast or drink wine, but they say he has an evil spirit. The true human being comes feasting and drinking, and they say he eats too much and is a drunk, a friend of tribal tax collectors and outcasts. But wisdom is like a mother who knows what her children are doing and can see right through them. And so Creator sets free, turned his eyes to the sky, and sent his voice to the Great Spirit. I honor you, O Great Father, maker of earth and sky, he prayed. For you have hidden these things from the ones who are wise in their own eyes, but have shown them to the humble of heart. Yes, my Father, it has made your heart glad to see this day come. And then he turned to the ones who walked the road with him. My father has put everything into my hands, he said with a solemn voice. Only the father knows the son, and only the son knows the father. No one can know the father in his fullness unless the son makes him known. Then he lifted his eyes up to the horizon as if he were speaking to all the world. Come close to my side, you hearts are on the ground. You who are pushed down and worn out, and I will refresh you. 
Follow my teachings and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest from your troubled thoughts. Walk side by side with me, and I will share in your heavy load, and I will make it light. Here ends our gospel reading. When I first read this gospel passage a few months ago in preparation for our worship committee meeting, I remember really bristling up against it. I said a first read of the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, I didn't understand what Jesus was talking about when he was making the comparison of generations. I didn't understand the context he was speaking in, nor did I understand the message he calls us to at the end of the passage. Upon a much closer reading this week uh, and some more research, I found it to be an extremely relevant passage for our modern times and one with a message I think many of us can benefit from. So first, for some context of where we are in the narrative. At this point in Matthew, Christ has just finished instructing his 12 disciples before they go out into the world ministering with him. Shortly after those teachings concluded, uh, Jesus receives a message from John the Baptist, who I hope you may remember is Jesus' cousin, and has been proclaiming the arrival of the Messiah. And at this point in the story, John is in prison after being arrested for the following of disciples he had gained and the message that he was proclaiming. Now Christ sends the messenger back to John to tell him of the miracles he has performed thus far. He then turns to speak to the crowd about John, explaining the role that he has played in the salvation history of the people. And it is in that speech that we hear the context of the fir- that is the context of the first part of our gospel passage. Now it's also interesting to note that the verses between the two parts of our passage, right? Because we had a 16 through 19, then we skipped to 25 through 30. Uh, they include Jesus chastising cities that he that have not repented and changed, even though that they have received his gift of miracles. Now, this may give give us some context clues to the discussion on generations in a little bit. The last bit of context I would like to highlight is one that a commentary shared with me this week. Chapter 11 of Matthew begins what many scholars would classify as the third section of the gospel, which highlights a growing division in Christ's ministry between those who would follow and change their ways and those who would not. And this section is bookended with two scenes that are questioning Jesus' identity. The first being the messenger that John sent to ask him if he was the one to come. And the second is later in chapter 16, when Christ asks the disciples who people say the Son of Man is. It's the division part of this context that is very important when we consider the words surrounding the generational comparison today. Because... Christ is comparing the generations of his time with people who are not acting in right relationship, and they're acting in confusing ways. When someone plays a song, right, if they are, whether that's Vicky up on the organ for us, somebody at Thursdays in the Park at Franklin, somebody at the neighborhood, somebody else playing music around us, it is considered rude to just ignore it, Right? If somebody is taking their time and talents to provide a wonderful gift for you, to turn a blind eye to it and ignore it is rude. However, a right relationship would dance with it, respond to it, become a part of it. And when someone is in mourning, the proper response is to mourn in part with them, not to turn a blind eye, to look away until their period of mourning is over, but to walk with them to share with them and empathize with them. When he compares himself and John the Baptist together, he is demonstrating that they acted in two very different manners, and they had two very different approaches to their ministries. But both of them were met with snide remarks and people doubting their messages. John, for not drinking, uh, particularly alcohol, and to excess, and for eating uncommon foods like honey and locusts, was deemed by society to have some form of a demon. The Son of Man, on the other hand, who we assume to be Jesus, came eating and drinking, but not always with the right people, 
and is thus deemed a glutton, a drunkard, and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. The thing is, both Jesus and John were working to rebuild right community. In a time when people were isolated from one another, authority was centralized and used ruthlessly over people who were the others of society, and times were economically tough. For delivering the message that there is a better way to live in the here and now, John would eventually be beheaded and Jesus crucified on the cross. To what shall I compare this generation? They will not be satisfied until they remember what community is like, what rejoicing and mourning together is like. They will not be satisfied until they unify again. So as we consider this text at our Thursday service this past week, we reflected upon how similar these words felt for some of us. Comparing Jesus and John, it felt like a situation you couldn't win at. No matter what a religious leader or any person who wasn't in power at that time, for that matter, did, they were going to be told something was wrong about it. They were never going to be perfect for everybody, and yet it felt like that expectation was there. And that's one that I think many of us have felt too. This kind of expectation often gets accentuated during the generational transitions, I believe. The coming of age stories. We thought of on Thursday the ways it felt to be a young and upcoming generation for many of us. We remembered, or were currently living, how so many aspects of our lives felt like we couldn't win in the eyes of our parents and grandparents. Whether that was the clothes we wore, the way we did our hair, the music we listened to, the cars or other material goods we acquired, decorations we liked, or so much more. If we followed the path our friends were and did doing, uh, what st filled our soul, the elder generations would let us know it was wrong. It wasn't their ways. If we did our best to carry on the way things had been for the previous generations and lifestyle and goals, then our own generation would dismiss us, and the elder generation would still inform us that we weren't doing it quite right. Memories came to mind of the British invasion with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and the divides that music would cause in households and friend groups across America. In more recent times, we heard a story from someone who was now living as the elder generation, who had jokingly and lovingly criticized a younger generational member's hair for having a bleached streak in it, asking them if they were now a skunk. But the issue with not accepting people and generations as they are and loving them for who they are, for allowing and perpetuating the divisions between them, is that we come to this deep place of weariness. If you can never win, if there are constantly more burdens being thrown upon you, then you will eventually grow weary from the load of responsibility that you feel, whether it is your responsibility or not. This weariness begins to sit in your very soul, and the next thing you know, you feel empty. To return to music for a brief moment, there's a song released last year that gained a lot of popularity very quickly, uh, particularly with my generation. It was called Numb Little Bug by M. Behold. I, I never actually know artist names. And its chorus, I'm not going to sing it for you, but here's the words to the chorus, the lyrics. Do you ever get a little bit tired of life? Like you're not really happy, but you don't want to die. Like you're hanging by a thread, but you've got to survive because you've got to survive. Like your body's in the room, but you're not really there. Like you're, you have empathy inside, but you don't really care. Like you're fresh out of love, but it's been in the air. And my past repair. And she goes on in the song to name some things she's tired of doing. Like she's tired of quick repairs for coping mechanisms. She's tired of feeling like she's sinking with water in her boat that can't get out. And these things make her feel like she's barely staying afloat and barely breathing. And she culminates the lyrics with, 
well, I guess I'm just broken and broke. This song remained on America Billboard's Hot 100 for 18 weeks, peaking at rank 18 in June of 2022, and it spent three weeks as the number one song on the Billboard Adult Top 40 list. Amongst my friend group, at the very least, it struck a resonating chord with how many of us have been feeling at that time, and many of us still are today. Exhausted, hopeless, and a deep sense of weariness for where we had come from and where we are going. Now, as one commentary I read about the gospel this week asked, what does it say about a society when their children are exhausted, aggrieved, and endangered? What does it mean for the future when youth are ignored, deprioritized, and unrepresented? How can a society stand when the destruction of youth and children runs unabated? These are big questions. The commentary goes on to point out this idea, when the most vulnerable among us are made whole, an entire society flourishes. The antidote to weariness is personified as wisdom. And then the commentary quotes Anna Case Winters as she discusses the wisdom reference in verse 19, which has a lot of Jewish and Hebrew uh, connotation to it, but I don't think we want a whole lecture today. I love the wisdom literature, though. But here's what Anna Case Winters says. Here, Jesus identifies with wisdom, a traditional feminine image of the divine. Wisdom founded the earth, walks in justice, guides into truth, and is beloved of God. Later verses in this chapter continue the themes of the traditional role of wisdom, including divine revelation and life-giving refreshment and comfort. Wisdom also has a history of mixed reception. It's accepted by the few and rejected by the many. And this has been Jesus' experience as well, thus far in his ministry. I love the name that the First Nations translation has given to Jesus. That's Creator Sets Free. Creator Sets Free spends his whole life trying to show us a better and wiser way to live than we often do. Creator Sets Free tells us that if we come to him, we can lay our burdens down and pick up his yoke. The burden he gives to us, which is much lighter than all the piles of stones that society would have us grab. Creator Sets Free tells us to do two things. To love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our minds, and all our souls. And to love our neighbor as we would love ourselves. Our neighbors include our family, our own generational members, and all the members of the generations before us and after us, living, dead, and yet to come. The Creator sets free, does indeed set us free from the bondage of rugged individualism that makes each person into the singular, small, individual pillar that must be the foundation and cornerstone for whole houses. And instead, invites us to bring our pillars together, to bring ourselves together, and be the foundations for a communal gathering lodge. And Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What saving grace might you find in letting your own deep weariness guide you to Christ? What ways might you act differently in your daily life before, if, before you took any action, you asked yourself if it was loving to God and loving to all your neighbors? What moods might change in the world if we celebrated upcoming generations with the same vigor that we remember accomplishments from the previous ones? And lastly, I'll share a story about the most vulnerable in society and what that can mean for our, all of our flourishing. I've only been to my seminary campus once. 
and I have a very distinct memory from that visit, was that the ramp used to enter the building, which they were required to have to be ADA accessible, was not where most ramps would be. Many of us who are non-disabled people don't see ramps. We don't look for them, if they're even there at all. Because we don't need to pay attention to them usually, especially not like disabled people would. Ramps are often hidden as back entrances or side entrances that the public can't see. Stairs, grand staircases, we cling to that idea. But my seminary, they made a commitment when they moved locations from their old campus to the new, not to just be ADA certified, but to be inclusive to the disabled community, whether that is physical, mental, or other health needs. Their ramp is their main entrance, dead center. It is the stairs that are off to the side. And you know what happens when non-disabled people like myself and Emma visit my seminary? By God, we can use the ramp, and so can anybody else who enters. Personally, I prefer ramps. My knees are a little painful from all the burdens I carried in the army. And so going upstairs makes it a little more painful. Quoting the commentary again, when the most vulnerable among us are made whole, an entire society flourishes. When we put those who have the most need first, we all benefit. Sometimes the best cure for weariness is to reach out and love those around you without any expectations of anything in return. And that is the burden that Christ is calling us to. May we bear that yoke with pride and honor. May it be so, and amen. Let us join now in a moment of prayer together. Burden-taking God, we come before you with heavy loads today, knowing that there is family trauma in our buckets, tasks that we didn't finish at work that seem to just pile and pile up, doubts of our own availability to parent, doubts of how well we've done as children. We come before you still hopeful that we can make a better world together. And we come before you asking for some reprieve. We come trusting that we can lay our burdens before you as your son called us to. And we can still receive a burden again, but one that is far lighter and more fulfilling. We ask that you walk with us, that we can continue to learn from your son who lived so long ago, that as the body of Christ still on this earth, we take burdens from people and do not put them upon them. And we know we can pray all this through your son, who taught us this prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us rise and join and be not dismayed, number 460 in the hymnal.
Please be seated. Feels really good to actually have a UCC moment again today. Uh, we haven't for a few weeks, or at least not one that's actually been UCC oriented. Uh, so if you don't know, our general synod was this past week. It was uh, June 30th, I believe, to July 5th. Uh, I opted not to go this year. Uh, it happens every other year. We did have a member from our church there, uh, the Reverend Andrew Warner, uh, but he was there on business because he works for the national setting. Uh, so he wasn't representing us, but it was nice to have him there, and maybe uh, I'll try to invite him to report a little bit on what happened. Uh, but it was really cool. Our conference Facebook page, uh, the Wisconsin Conference, they kept on sharing uh, throughout the week different updates from delegates who had gone on behalf of their churches and the conference to represent us, uh, I believe it was in Indianapolis. Uh, and one of the days really struck me as interesting, one of the reflections that was shared. So as we've talked about before in the UCC moment, the UCC has always recognized coming from a stream of four different denominations. There were the Congregational Churches of the English Reformation. They have Puritan roots in New England. There were the Congregational Churches of the English Reformation. Ooh, nope. The Christian Church, which had American frontier beginnings. Then there was the Evangelical Synod of North America. And that's where this church would trace its roots back to. When we first founded, it, it was part of the Evangelical Synod. And then there was the Reformed Church in the United States, and that began in Pennsylvania. But on July 4th, this post was shared to the conference page. Today's General Synod takeaway comes from Julie Eklund, and it reminds us that the nation we celebrate today is still on the journey to living into its ideals. Julie was moved by what she learned about the UCC's fifth stream, and that's the Afro-Christian Convention of the South. They would eventually go on to become the AMA, and I forget what that stands for. But it's an often overlooked when the domination call, recalls its roots. And Julie said, I need to teach my congregation about the fifth strand of the UCC to include the Afro-Christian Convention of the South. It is hard for me to comprehend that we hid a part of our history while also claiming to be the first to ordain an African-American pastor in 1785. It's always fascinating when you dig a little deeper what you find out in the history books. Uh, and the AMA, some of the work that they did is phenomenal, and it is one that I have not recognized before you guys before either, even though I knew it. So, I don't know if they made a resolution at General Senate or not to officially change some of our polity books, and it'll take a while for me to remember this too, but there are five strands of the UCC. With that, I invite JR forward for our invitation and generosity, and if our ushers would be willing to head on back. Invitation to generosity from Worship Ways. Our God plays the flute for us. Do we not hear it? Shall we not respond with a dance? Shall we not come to each other with thanksgiving and in turn share the gifts that we have? How might we be abundant? And in what ways are we still in need? Let us bring it all as an offering through our faith and humanity. Amen.
Methodist Rise for a doxology. Let us join our unison prayer of dedication. What weighs us down doesn't just disappear in the wind, but rather lightens because the load is shared. So God of our yoke, may we prosper in solidarity. May what feels hard be the right kind of hard, one that strengths us in growth and connection. Let the cycle of suffering finally have its last day, and the year of jubilee begin with us. Amen. And let us join in our sending hymn, Softly and Tenderly, number 449 in the hymnal.
Just one reminder, the faith formation class on Wednesday, uh, if you can come, that'd be great. It is a graded project for me. There will, we'll be recording it as we go because this is for a class I'm doing at my seminary. So, But they're grading me, not you guys, just so you know. I won't be grading you guys at all. Uh, it's more of a community learning event. But please receive this benediction. O God of rejuvenation, may we leave this place feeling alive, awake, and made for this day. In you there is hope for satisfaction, while our hunger for justice remains everlasting. May we find strength and gentleness and relief to heavy loads. And may we carry your promise of refuge with us wherever we go. Amen. Go forth in peace, friends. Enjoy the day. It's beautiful out today.